I'm very, very happy um, that we have today with us Matt Brennan, University of Glasgow, an assistant professor. And um, we are very happy to have you here today, Matt. I'm sorry about that. Um, to give us a bit of an insight on the concepts of sustainability. Because we were thinking, let's start this, uh, let's start this forum with some food for thought. Let's start this forum with, OK, what are the different possibilities, ideas, definitions of sustainability in music because of our very broad and open topic, sustain music for this European Forum on Music. So I'm very, very happy to welcome Matt on stage for the keynote speech. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, that's a very tough act to follow. <laughs> you know, some of the most beautiful music you've ever heard. And then, hi, I'm an academic with PowerPoint slides. Uh, so I can only apologize for that. Um, I would like to thank you for that introduction. Uh, I wanted to first say that as a dual citizen of Canada and the UK, and as one of the majority of people in Scotland and millions across the UK who voted to remain in the EU, uh, and we're unhappy to leave. I remain grateful for the opportunity to participate in European meetings like this. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, <laughs> I also thought, you know, just listening to some of the, the introductions setting up this uh, conference today, we've already heard, in essence, this wonderful example of what I want to talk about, which is Different people interpret that word, sustain, in very different ways, you know? We heard someone come in representing the venue saying, okay, sustaining music, we're bringing people into this venue, we're trying all types of different traditions and musical cultures, and we're going to, you know, have this as a piece of infrastructure that, that, that will allow music to flourish in Budapest, right? Then you heard your man on the video saying, so great that the theme is sustained music, talking all about the ecological transition that we need to make. And, and then in between, I think uh, you put it best when, when you gave that great phrase about how do we balance decisions when the solution to one problem contradicts the solution to another problem. And I thought, you know, it's kind of like, that is, Exactly what I wanted to say and should have said and takes a fraction of the time that I'm going to unfortunately take for you guys now. Um, so I've been asked to talk about concepts of sustainability. Sustainability, as you will have gathered, is a very slippery concept that's migrated from the world of policy speak and infiltrated the discourse of arts and culture. As a result, the term is now much used and sometimes abused by industry lobbying groups, policymakers, academics, and arts organizations across the creative sector. Despite having been co-opted for a range of conflicting purposes, the concept of sustainability is not likely to disappear from public discourse. The 2015 UN SDGs, or Sustainable Development Goals, are designed to underpin the global socio-political agenda until the year 2030. And as a result, sustainability remains a watchword of the early 21st century, with many of us struggling to balance its wide-ranging meanings and interpretations to address the urgent economic, environmental, and humanitarian challenges facing our planet. As a music academic, I'm really interested in the relationship between music and sustainability in all of its forms, as well as how related concepts like music ecosystems are used in the arts and culture sector. I'm aware that some of you in the room will already be very familiar with the origins of sustainable development, uh, in which case, apologies, this is a wee refresher. Um, some of you may be less familiar, so my goal here is to try briefly to put us all on the same page. Uh, now, where do we start? This is a good place. 1987, long time ago now. Uh, there was a report that the UN published in that year called Our Common Future, also known as the Brundtland Report, which aimed to address the critical issues of environment and development and to formulate concrete actions to deal with them. It famously defined sustainable development as, quote, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. 
The next major shift in conceptualizing sustainability came with the UN Conference on Environment and Development held in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, sometimes known as the Earth Summit. This summit introduced the concept of three pillars of sustainability, environmental, social, and economic. You'll also sometimes see these pillars represented as intersecting circles. The idea here is that sustainable development is built on the necessary combination of these three foundations. Sustainable development needs to balance the interests of the economy, a fair society, and a habitable environment. This is all great in theory, but the problem has historically been that the institutions, both private and public, with the power to deliver sustainable development, have tended to prioritize the economy first, with the fair society coming in second, and the environment a distant third place. In the 30-odd years since the Earth Summit in Rio, it's fair to say that humans have failed to develop a more environmentally sustainable global order. And of course, humanity as a whole depends on a habitable planet to survive. So to overcome the tendency to prioritize economy, uh, give short shrift to equity, and ignore environment, a popular alternative has emerged to visualize sustainability, and that's in the form of these nested concentric circles. This nested basket model more clearly illustrates that economic prosperity doesn't actually mean much if that prosperity isn't fairly distributed. And fairly distributed economic prosperity becomes a bit pointless if it creates uh, an inhabitable planet uh, as a byproduct of that. So the nested basket model is supposed to demonstrate that sustainable prosperity should be contingent on a sustainable society, and both of those priorities depend on human activity being environmentally sustainable overall. So where does music come into this picture of sustainability? Eco-musicologist Aaron Allen and colleagues suggested that adding the concept of aesthetics to this nested model, arguing that the kind of world we want to sustain is, quote, not one that just considers environment equity and economics, but also one that includes joy, imagine that, <laughs> uh, excitement, emotion, goodness, and beauty, a world that looks good, feels good, sounds good, and is good, end quote. I really like that idea, and I've updated Alan's model here to reflect that music is a cultural practice, but also an economic one, and these two ways of thinking about music sometimes overlap and conflict. From a policy perspective, in the past two decades, there have been numerous milestones for music and sustainability. A partial list might include the 2003 UNESCO Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage, the 2004 launch of the UNESCO Creative Cities Network, which includes cities of music, and the 2005 Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions. In addition, Major research projects have been funded, notably the five-year Sustainable Futures for Music Cultures project that was funded by the Australian Research Council, ran in collaboration with the International Music Council, and uh, was conducted between 2009 and 2014. This project conceptualized the factors affecting the sustainability of music ecosystems that you can see here across five domains uh, uh, across the bottom, the first being learning and teaching in music, the second being musicians and communities, the third being contexts and constructs, the fourth, infrastructure and regulations, and the fifth, media and the music industry. There's way too much going on in this diagram, full stop, uh, and I can't really talk about it in detail in the time that I've got, but it's another useful model to add to the mix here, and I'm happy to share the link to it with anyone who's interested afterwards. So all of these efforts that I've mentioned have focused on sustaining music in different ways. Here are three to summarize so far. First, sustaining music practice as a form of human cultural expression. Second, sustaining music in a way that is fair, diverse, and inclusive. Third, sustaining music as a meaningful form of work at the individual, community, and sectoral levels. To complicate these three approaches even further, Huib Skippers, who led the Sustainable Futures project that you can see on the screen here, deliberately tried to move away from linking sustaining music to what he described as the preservation or safeguarding of an object, keeping a particular object in place rather than keeping the process that nurtures the tradition alive. 
Instead, he preferred to conceive of sustaining music as something closer to the French word soutenir, uh, or as skippers put it, you put your hand under something to support it so that it has the space to fly and develop in whatever way it wants, end quote. So you could roughly map the topics in this year's European Forum on Music according to these concepts of sustainability that we've discussed so far. I've used this intersecting circles version of the diagram, and I realize this is my own very rough attempt, uh, and some of you may see your topic occupying a very different place on this diagram. So we probably immediately need a second draft of this. Uh, but roughly, you can see already what's interesting and, and not surprising for this type of conference, given who's in the room, is that there's a, a, a tends to be a clustering around issues of equity, fair society, access, justice, um, maybe slightly less focus on the economy. If I was at Maidem, there would be a very different uh, clustering happening. If I was at you know, some sort of green events uh, industry seminar, a very different clustering again. Um, so I'm, I'm not putting this up in any sort of authoritative way, and I would love to learn more from you and listen as to why I'm wrong in the box that I put you in. Um, but it's just to kind of illustrate a wee point. And the point is this. The numerous options for conceptualizing sustainability can lead to a problem. The researcher Sarah Chandra Lele put this very well when he wrote that, quote, the strength of the term sustainable development, uh, sorry, just lost my place here. The strength of the term sustainable development, its universal appeal, is also its weakness, allowing it to be co-opted and redefined in ways that actually limit its goals and hence the societal challenges needed to achieve them. With that in mind, I now want to switch gears and talk a bit more about how we might conceptualize sustaining music in a way that tries to address all three key aspects using that nested basket idea. The idea that sustainable prosperity is contingent on fair society, and both of those priorities depend on human activity being environmentally sustainable overall, which of course it is not. And that's why I have to put a picture of Greta up on the screen. Yes, I'm going there. Uh, <laughs> I love Greta Thunberg. Uh, and I was lucky enough to see her speak in Glasgow during COP26 in 2021. And I have this recurring anxiety dream about her, and this is honestly true. In my anxiety dream, Greta is seated amongst the students in my university classroom. I'm teaching what I normally teach, some aspect of popular music or the music industries. She listens quietly for a few minutes, then stands up and leaves the room. She leaves for the same reason she left her own classroom in Sweden at the age of 15. My lecture is of no use to her, nor anyone of her generation. It's a lecture predicated on a future which does not exist. My lectures about the music industries are unwelcome distractions from a climate emergency. So how do I teach music responsibly during a climate emergency? How do I equip my students with knowledge and skills that will be relevant five years from now, 10 or 20 years from now? I understand that the global economy and the creative economy within it will be dramatically impacted by climate change in ways that are currently difficult to imagine, in much the same way that it was difficult to imagine the impact of a global pandemic on the music sector uh, until it actually happened in 2020. And yet I also feel confident in predicting certain truths about music in the future. Humans, I suspect, will continue to make music. Many will also try to make a living out of music, to monetize the labor of their music making. As has been the case ever since music became something you might consider paying for, making money out of music will almost certainly continue to be low security, precarious work where the supply of willing workers exceeds demand. All of the above conditions will likely persist even in the face of a climate emergency. There are a few more certainties to weigh up. The music industries, like any industrial sector, have environmental consequences. Live music and music tourism encourage audience and artist travel, as well as energy consumption in the production of live performances. The recorded sector relies on the infrastructure of the inf internet and its related carbon emissions. It also produces luxury goods like vinyl records from non-renewable oil-based plastics. I could say that none of this is music's problem, and actually music just needs to focus on music. 
After all, it's a relatively low emitting industry, and the real problem we all know is big multinational corporations and large industries like transport, energy, food production, investment banking, manufacturing, and so on. But music activity is, of course, reliant on all of those infrastructures. As an example, I relied on the aviation industry to fly from Edinburgh to Budapest to attend this conference. So I'm as guilty as anyone, and it's very difficult to extricate yourself, no matter what your intentions are, if you want to participate in a really amazing conference, for instance, right? Um, there are these balances. The solution to one problem contradicts the solution to a different problem. But as Thunberg puts it, we all have a choice now. We can create transformational action that will safeguard the living conditions for future generations, or we can continue with our business as usual and fail. We are at a time in history where everyone with any insight of the climate crisis, and I take that to mean including people in the music industry, that, uh, you know, anyone with any insight into that that threatens our civilization and the entire biosphere must speak out in clear language, no matter how uncomfortable and unprofitable that may be. We have to change almost everything in our current societies. I want you to act as if our house is on fire, she famously said, because it is. So Thunberg uses strong language to make us realize climate change is an immediate crisis. And the reason she needs to do this is that we're often trying to address multiple competing crises at the same time. In the arts and culture, certainly, we often first face the threat of defunding and budget cuts. A second and related threat to the sector is poor working conditions for music professionals. In recent years, there's been increasing evidence from researchers like Sally Ann Gross and George Musgrave that while participation in music is sometimes linked to health and well-being benefits, participation in the music industries is more often linked to ill health. The consequence of these two factors can be seen in the exodus of music workers across the sector in the wake of the pandemic who have not returned to working in music. Add to that the rising cost of living or keeping a music organization running for that matter, and it takes all of one's energy to address those issues, not leaving a whole lot of capacity to consider the underlying biosphere crisis important as that might be. So this is just a very sad collection of Twitter quotes uh, illustrating all these things. I don't know if your Twitter feed is the same as my Twitter feed, but I get a lot of just, oh, bad news, <laughs> you know, from, from, from multiple areas of work. Uh, so we don't need to dwell on that, but just to say, it's not just me, it's a thing. <laughs> right, so one possible consequence of these multiple crises competing for our attention is the trend across the music sector to borrow from the language of environmental science to describe its own situation, using terms like music ecology, ecosystem, and sustainability. Previously, academic researchers have tended to discuss music culture using frameworks taken from fields like sociology, anthropology, and cultural studies. We used to talk about music culture, networks, or communities. Meanwhile, the music industries and policymakers used to frame music using the language of business management and urban planning, talking about creative sectors, creative economies, or clusters. But now, we increasingly use terms like music ecologies and ecosystems. And I think part of this, whether it's conscious or not, is a strategic move to raise the tone of music policy discourse to a level of urgency that can compete with the other crises that are currently in play and demanding our attention and investment. What I find interesting with the terms uh, music ecology and music ecosystem, with all of the environmental connotations that they carry, is how they've migrated over the 2010s from academic discourse into music industry and cultural policy discourse. There's a famous Canadian example that I have up on the screen here. In 2015, the key lobbying organization for major record companies in Canada called Music Canada published a highly influential report called The Mastering of a Music City, which advocated for city councils to develop bespoke music policies. Throughout the report, the musical activity of cities is often described as an ecosystem, which in their words, generates rich social, cultural, and economic benefits. Since that report was published, many cities around the world have published their own music policies using similar terms. And I think that there's actually a lot of good work that's happening in that space. You know, it's getting people to take music seriously, usually people who are outside of music, right? And this is convincing and persuasive rhetoric. 
but sometimes it downplays how the creative economy is entangled in wider infrastructures causing environmental crisis. So I want to propose now two alternative concepts that might help address some of these issues. And my first is inspired by Kate Rayworth's model of donut economics, which she devised in 2011 with Oxfam and popularized in her 2017 book of the same title. Essentially, the donut economics model acknowledges that the objective of unchecked economic growth is propelling humanity towards irrevocable damage to the planet and a projected sixth mass, ext mass extinction event. The model of donut economics is founded on a simple diagram illustrating a sustainable window for economic activity, providing, in Rayworth's words, a social foundation of well-being that no one should fall below and an ecological ceiling of planetary pressure that we should not go beyond. Between the two lies a safe and just space for all. You see in the diagram, for example, elements of social foundation include energy, water, food, health, education, and so on. Well, the consequences of overshooting the ecological ceiling include all kinds of bad things. Rayworth's model of economic activity is about as high level as it's possible to get, global in scale. But she encourages people working in different areas to adapt and apply the model to their own fields. So, based on Rayworth's donut, I want to offer a tentative de definition for a music donut, which is both provocative and delicious. So, what is a music donut? A sustainable system for musical life that contributes to a social foundation of well-being that no one should fall below, while respecting the ecological ceiling of planetary pressure we should not go beyond. A sustainable music ecosystem operates between the limits of the aforementioned foundation and ceiling, a safe and just musical space for all. Wouldn't we all like to live there? I think there is also room for the donut to embrace a more radical collection of ideas, for example, circular economy and degrowth, as part of what makes it a distinctive approach, an approach that actively questions the merits of economic growth at an industrial scale and all the industries that it depends on. It's an approach that I hope to encourage my students to think about and incorporate into their scholarly thinking, as well as their career strategies. Rayworth's donut model is obviously not without its critics, and I'm still learning about critiques of the donut model uh, as I work towards finishing an article on this idea. So I now want to offer a second concept of a musical utopia. This also sounds pretty nice, doesn't it? Uh, here I'm drawing on the work of climate fiction, or cli-fi, it's a genre, uh, the author Kim Stanley Robinson, whose book Ministry for the Future I can highly recommend. I'm even more taken with his 2011 essay, Remarks on Utopia in the Age of Climate Change. In it, he argues, and this is a quote, climate change is inevitable. We're already in it. The infrastructures we build have lifetimes that last decades, sometimes centuries, and changing them necessarily takes time. We're probably not going to be able to cap the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere at less than 450 parts per million. At that point, we'll be living on quite a different planet in a significantly damaged biosphere with its life support systems harmed so that human existence will be substantially threatened. It has become a case of utopia or catastrophe, and utopia has gone from being a somewhat minor literary problem to a necessary survival strategy. There's a strong role for the arts and humanities in this utopian project, according to Robinson. He says, quote, it's the humanities' job to disabuse scientists of the mistaken notion that scientific endeavor is straightforward and non-political by way of fully supportive lessons in history, philosophy, political theory, rhetoric, and art. So one coping strategy could be to envision what kind of musical, what musical culture would look like and sound like in a carbon neutral civilization, and then consider the steps that are needed to get there. This would actually be in line with current academic research on sustainable development. As Bendor and colleagues have argued, convincing publics and policymakers to address the global challenge of sustainable development simply by presenting data-driven arguments and scientific consensus has ultimately been a failure. In short, as they put it, sustainability can no longer rely exclusively on scientific knowledge production to determine the right path to a single sustainable future. Rather, it relies on how well society explores, imaginatively inhabits, and evaluates multiple possible futures, on the kinds of stories societies tell about who they are and what is important to them, 
and on the avenues for collective action that open up as a consequence, end quote. Ben Noor and all uh, have begun to experiment with approaches to public engagement projects on sustainability that shifts away from making people face some brutal reality, away from a single slow-moving disaster scenario, and towards enchanting them with the openness of the world as an imaginary place. I think there's actually a lot of room for the music sector uh, to contribute to that wider experiment. And I actually did some research on this topic uh, recently in the UK in partnership with um, a group of record companies that are called Beggars Group and a um, music and climate organization called Music Declares Emergency, which some of you may know. Uh, there's a myth that music was more linked to social movements in the 60s and 70s, but in recent decades has maybe lost some of that wider social resonance. So, our research team wanted to understand whether the link between music fans and broader social consciousness was still strong when it came to climate change. To do that, we surveyed just over 2,000 adults across the UK, asking them questions about their music engagement on the one hand, and then a separate list of questions about their attitudes on climate change. The survey was distributed by YouGov to a broad range of respondents, making up a nationally represented sample of British adults in terms of age, gender, social class, and education. Importantly, the respondents weren't all music lovers, which allows us to make a comparison between fans and non-fans. We asked people to rate how important music was to them personally and also in their daily routines. And from that, we got a data set of roughly 1,000 fans for whom music was important or very important, and roughly 1,000 others who said music was not so important to them. And we could then compare these two groups when it came to their attitudes on climate change. On climate change, the poll found that 82% of music fans were concerned about climate change compared to 72% of non-music fans. And while both music fans and non-fans tend to see climate change as an important issue which should be addressed, music fans are significantly more likely to view it as a top priority, with 54% of music fans agreeing that tackling climate change should be a top priority now above other issues as compared to 47% of non-fans. I think we can use these findings in at least two ways. First, we can use the findings to persuade the music sector as a whole to take even bolder steps towards reducing their carbon footprints, ones that might even require audiences to change their behavior a little bit, because we now have data showing that music audiences would support that more strongly compared to the general public. Second, there's an opportunity to engage music audiences who feel more strongly about climate change to help drive change beyond the music industry. Music may have a small carbon footprint relative to other sectors, but it relies on a much bigger and not very glamorous infrastructure of high emitting in industries like transport, manufacturing, and so on. So we can now think about new ways in which we might encourage music participants to adopt sustainable behaviors with a view towards accelerating green transition across the wider infrastructure and the society that they're embedded in. UNESCO is also encouraging this kind of activity. In February 2022, UNESCO published its global report monitoring the implementation of the 2005 Convention on the Production and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions. The report noted that, quote, national sustainable development planning has recognized the cultural and creative sectors as levers to advance cultural, social, and economic outcomes, but despite this, the role played by culture and creativity in sustainable development, including for the environmental transition, remains widely underinvested, as it's only acknowledged in 13% of voluntary national reviews monitoring the implementation of the UN SDGs. So to that end, uh, I'm starting, oh, it's cut off a little bit there, um, and I'm nearly done, I should also say. Uh, I've started a new project this year called Imagining a Just and Green Future for Music Cities, the case of Glasgow as a UNESCO city of music. I've got two research questions on the bottom. Um, what does adjusting green transition mean in the context of a city's music industry and culture? And how can music activity be integrated into the city's wider just and green transition strategy? We're currently making things like a geospatial map of music in Glasgow uh, on which it's possible to add other cool maps that other researchers are making on things like cycling infrastructure. So you can just layer it on top of all of the music organizations and venues to figure out where your bike rental stations are, um, what the cycle paths are that are being built up by the city. 
Uh, you can also add, for instance, all of the work the Environment Agency is doing on flood risk to start having a very honest conversation with some of the larger venues that are right next to the river, of course, about like what the next 20 years might look like for them. So I think there, you could also add, for instance, um, a layer that looks at all of the uh, poverty indexes across the city to think about how close music organizations are clustered uh, to wealth, essentially. And there will be no surprises there, of course. But there's a lot of potential, I think, for that sort of mapping. We're also doing even weirder maps of relationships. Um, so I want our map to be able to us to kind of see where a, a music organization is located, but then for us to also click on that organization and see who that organization talks to, what, you know, regardless of whether they're their neighbor or not, who do they deal with on a daily basis? Who are their suppliers? Um, if you're a large arena, you might have a de dedicated member of staff with the word sustainability in their job title. If you're a tiny venue, you probably don't. You're probably just trying to survive to the next day. But with this sort of map, where you can see here what, what it's representing, oh, it's super bad, um, but it's in progress, guys, it's a draft. Um, in the center, those are the most connected music organizations. And then the ones on the outside are the least connected, right? You can kind of see these little nodes going to one lonely thing on the end. So we're wondering, like, who's lonely? Who's central? And how do we actually maybe add some resource to make some more connections and provide help and support to organizations that are less connected or that could usefully be collectively connected to other organizations. Right. To conclude, <laughs> as we enjoy this conference uh, and learn more about perspectives, about what it might mean to sustain music, I'm going to keep this little toolkit of concepts in my mind. The aim to sustain music can be understood in at least four overlapping ways. Sustain music as a form of human expression, Sustain music in a way that's fair, diverse, and inclusive. Sustain music as a form of meaningful work at the individual, community, and sectoral levels. Sustain music as part of and a means to participate in the larger existential project of sustaining a habitable earth for future generations and mitigating climate catastrophe. Or something else entirely. I expect to learn new definitions and versions of this word uh, and how you guys interpret it as I attend this conference. Uh, thank you again for the invitation to speak. I look forward to chatting and learning from all the people in this room over the conference. If anyone wants to talk to me about any of the stuff I mentioned, please feel free. I would love to chat. Uh, and thank you all for listening. <laughs>